Greetings and welcome back. This is Benjamin Nuss, MREA instructor and Mid-State Technical College instructor. This next section is on collector mounting. So what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about the different places and placements for our solar thermal collector array. We'll talk first about uh, roof mounting and then look at some ground mount options in addition to some of the piping installation. So all of the installation components that are going to take place on the roof or outside of the home. Now the first thing we want to consider is of course the roof structure in which we're mounting into. We want to make sure that we're putting this onto a nice solid foundation uh, to begin with. I have never seen an instance where a collector has fallen through a roof. I've seen a couple of, of cases where collectors have actually blown off of roof because they weren't properly attached to the structure. So step one, of course, is going to be locating each of the structural members to make sure that we're not just going to be attaching onto the roof deck, but onto some of the skeleton or the uh, after, actual rafters or trusses that we see. So step one is really going to be locating them and trying to find a place that's going to have sufficient clearance and sufficient space for the collector and the ability to work around those spaces. Now we can put collectors when attached to buildings in any number of places. The simple solution is, of course, is to have a south facing roof and to have them what is effectively mounted flat onto the roof. When they're mounted flat, it, it most easy, evenly distributes the weight in addition to minimizing any of the wind load issues in terms of lift uh, or pull out. We can, uh, of course, mount them in that same orientation, tilt it up on the roof to find our ideal pitch, or in some cases we can do what's called, considered a sawtoothed array um, that is either going to be happening on a south facing roof or an east or west roof. Now what's not shown here is that it's actually not uncommon to mount them facing west or facing east. We are seeing more of that in a flush mount scenario. Uh, the challenge with that of course is that you're not going to be facing directly into the sun and you will have a reduction in performance. Uh, however, that reduction is about 25%, and most of the time we can feel, find that to be accommodated for by just increasing that collector array size by about that same 25%. We've seen some interesting installations that were uh, wall mounted uh, uh, against the wall, either flat against the wall. We've seen some space heating applications that have done that, or to be tilted and kind of ground mounted or leaning against building structures. I've seen a couple of clever installations where they were actually awnings. They were put above the windows that functioned as uh, shading that window in some of the summertime. So all of these are certain options that we have. Now, of course, one of the things that we need to consider when, when mounting on these structures is the wind loading that, that's going to happen. And collectors will act like big sails. They can catch the wind and they can be blown off. So we have to be weary of that and to make sure that the, the best way to confront that is to make sure that we have good, strong structural connections. And we'll give some examples of the preferred collector attachment methods. We will have both the kind of uplift force or this push in a way, kind of a drag force. Also, as wind passes over, you will have some suction on the glazing. Now, most manufactured collectors will be um, totally capable of handling both of these force, and most of the time collectors are designed to handle 100 mile an hour winds. Ground mount options are another uh, attractive choice that we have. Uh, we have a lot more space oftentimes in ground mount locations, especially in rural areas. In urban areas, sometimes roofs are going to be the only choices, but ground mount is always going to be an acceptable place as well. It's always a good idea to make sure that that collector is elevated enough off the ground that any snow fall will be able to accumulate beneath. Now, um, normally the minimum there is about 18 inches, but I always recommend a minimum of about three feet of fall because it's not just the ground snow that you're worried about, but all of the snow that sheds off the collector will accumulate down at the bottom. And you don't want to have to uh, shovel or move any of that. So three feet is a, is a good rule of thumb to make sure you're not dealing with any snow issues. 
When we're down on the ground, we also have reduced uh, wind loads and can have multiple different tilt angles. Sometimes it will be more expensive depending on the roof conditions, depending also on the type of ground structure that you have. This particular method is showing uh, pillars. These are um, base shaped ones. There are also ones that are large tubes. And we want to make sure that like any foundation, we extend below the frost line to minimize issues with heaving and movement of those foundations. In a couple instances, we have seen some actually ground ballasted methods where you have a big anchor and the collectors are uh, just held in place by that anchor. And we have seen some of them be quite successful. When we are up on a roof, the most common way to do it is this kind of standoff mounting where you have the structural member, you have the roof shingles or sheathing or she she sheathing and shingles that are, are covering that, whatever roof membrane you have. And then the collector uh, has a couple of brackets that hold it a, a little bit off the roof. It does make it a little bit easier for instances where we're going to be uh, re-roofing and need to take it down. Oftentimes you can take it down, leave the structural supports that are in place uh, right there, and then uh, bring the collector in and put it back up. Here's a couple of examples uh, of that. You can see this picture um, is using a rail, and this is obviously PV up here, but you can see a few of the rails that well, were used in this collector mounting strategy. The rail was put on the roof, the collectors were then placed on top, and then there are a couple of brackets that held the collector in place. So a standoff and rail is certainly becoming much more, much more common with solar thermal collectors and not just PV collectors. Sometimes we'll build an entire rack to mount the collectors. Again, this is very common. It does allow snow and rain under the collector, and we want to make sure that we do have a place for some of it to accumulate. And again, we want all of this to be as structurally as sound as, as possible. Um, here's a good example of that. This rack style is very common for evacuated tube collectors, where you have uh, all of this rack and assembly that comes with the collector itself. Now, most of the time, these, just like any of the mounting hardware, will be specific to that collector because of the way that the frame is going to be constructed. Here's another example of a rack mount. One of the advantages, of course, of a rack mount is that you have fewer penetrations that will need to be put into the roof as long as they can hand those weight, handle those weight limits. In a few instances, we've seen this flush mount where the collectors become the waterproofing membrane itself. Oftentimes we refer to this as something like building integrated, where we displace those actual roofing materials. And sometimes that can reduce the cost of the installation. Instead of going over top of the roofing materials, you're uh, uh, using this instead. Now, if it's a retrofit, then you're not really saving anything there. But in cases of new construction, it minimizes the amount of roofing material that you have to purchase. Of course, it requires the correct roof pitch in our installation because we cannot tilt this up back without building a bunch of structure, which is not recommended. Here's an example of one of those. These particular collectors are, are also made by a company that makes skylights, and so they're intended to look roughly about the same. And you can see that just like a skylight, they are fully flashed in. They have step flashings that move up along the way, flush mounted, all the penetrations go back underneath the collector, and that's where all the plumbing runs as well. So that is certainly an option. What is not really done anymore is this integrated mount, where the collector is actually built into part of the roof structure itself. This was very common in the late 70s and early 80s, I guess not really common, but uh, you would occasionally see this, where the collectors were home built. And so it was just part of the roof that the collectors themselves were built in and, and part of the structural member. No one's really doing this anymore because all of the collectors that we install tend to be uh, SRCC rated and certified in order to receive any tax incentives and, and federal tax credits. There are some concerns, of course, about how this is properly flashed in to ensure that we don't have any water problems. Um, so there, there just introduces uh, several more potential or a lot more potential for leaks due to
due to kind of the expansion and contraction of each of these members moving independently. Now, uh, I'm going to skip ahead to, uh, well, we'll look at this one first. Um, we we want to look at, at how we are attaching the L brackets or attaching any of these structures to the roof. What was very common uh, was to use some sort of an L bracket that was simply caulked down to the roofing membrane. And this is something that we're really encouraging people to move against. So ignore some of this part up here and let's focus instead about how we are attaching um, onto this individual structure. Now, what this method shows is this here you have uh, two by four trusses in both sides and then a spacer that is in between and then a long threaded rod that runs all the way and the spanner that goes underneath these. So this would be something like a two by six or in some cases unistrut. Now what we've found out is that this particular attachment we did for years um, but is now being discouraged by structural engineers. Whenever you're putting weight on one of these brackets or something, the attachment collector uh, or collector attachment, we have two forces really at play. Now, one of them is going to be lift. And anecdotally, the problem that we all have always seen is that the lift of these collectors caused by wind loads and lift loads and drag loads causes these things to loosen over time and to, to pull out. And so we were for years putting this spanner underneath to make sure that you were attaching basically onto both of these and preventing that pull out. However, the other force that plays the downward force of the weight of the collectors themselves. And when the bracket is placed here, and this is obviously not to scale, is pl placed in between the two trusses, you are then turning this particular structure here, which is just a roof sheathing or roof decking, which is five eighths or three eighths inch thick, into the support beam. And we have seen some instances where there were some sagging. So this particular uh, attachment method is really being discouraged at this particular point. I include it in here because we oftentimes will see this in some of the literature because we did this for years. It, it combated the number one problem that we saw and that, and that was lift. But um, um, we've been through several uh, versions with structural engineers and they're, they're really discouraging this particular type of method. So our other method is to find a way to lag bolt or place our attachment directly into the truss or rafter itself. Now this is still done and, and is still the simplest method, um, making sure of course that we pre-drill our hole and remove some of that to prevent splitting. The other challenge here is that that attachment really needs to find its way into the middle third of the member. And so what that means, if you're trying to go into a two by four or any two by material, you've got a half inch that you have to hit on the roof. So we really need to be precise. We need to pre-drill that. Most of our attachments are going to be with a three eighths inch lag bolt. Although we are seeing some reinforced structural screws that are five eighths that are uh, of comparable strength. The, the screw has you know, two forces on it. One is it being pulled out and then the other one is it being sheared off. And, and certainly the uh, stronger impact that collectors are putting on it are pull out. And so a lot of these newer structural screws have a smaller shaft, but they've got wider threads. And so they're equally as good uh, as some of these 3 8 inch lag bolts in terms of their pull out strength. So we're seeing a lot of installers spec those instead. So that certainly is preferred. Um, and uh, another one, that is not so encouraged anymore as one of these J bolts. They, if this is placed on the wrong side, then you're not going to be fully bearing that down over over top of the structural member. Um, the other main one, and I'll just describe it, uh, has the two rafters or trusses, and then. The roof decking runs straight across it, and then we actually add the spanner tight against the decking in between that particular opening. Now this is kind of the preferred method if you can't land into one of the trusses. You need to then have this be a 4x4 
ideally, if it has to be two two by fours, they need to be both glued and screwed together. This then functions as that support beam. Um, and we normally put in four 16D penny nails, end nailed from both sides to hold that in place. Some uh, cases I've seen structural engineers that also require a bracket that be installed in the corner of both of these that uh, act as a hanger bracket to prevent it from going down or from going up. Then you can have your penetration that goes over top of this that is either lagged into this or is a through bolt that runs all the way through. Both are going to be accepted mounting methods. Now, one other thing that we see here is all of this is showing an L with a ceiling pad underneath. And this is still occasionally done on metal roofs, but this is never done on shingle roofs. On all the shingle roofs, we have different type of attachments that are using some sort of a roof boot. This one has a pipe around it, but all of them have roof boots or flashing, and there's a lot of companies that make these specifically for solar. We want to make sure that every penetration that we put into the roof is, is going to be watertight and sealed uh, for, for the remaining life of the system. Same holds true when we look at our piping. Now, one of the challenges with a roof boot like this is that these are not going to be rated up to 350 degrees. So a roof boot that is of this variety, I will use something like this in the cold water return going back to the collector. Um, the one that is the hot line that's coming out, you have two options. One, they make a roof boot that has a copper connection that you actually solder onto the pipe, or instead of having the boot go right on the outside of the pipe itself, you take the pipe, you put insulation on it, and then you wrap it in some aluminum jacketing like you see here, and then you have the boot cover the jacketing itself. And I prefer something like this along the, the hot supply line for the reason that I can boot that, and then I also I can run the sensor wire not along the hot pipe, but in that space between the insulation and the actual jacketing. The one thing that wears off the quickest on the outside of the roof will be the jacketing. Um, they do make some insulation that they say is going to be UV protected, but I haven't had a lot of success with it. So I tend to jacket all of my pipe insulation that is going to be located on the roof. Okay. Um, I know that that is a, a short section on collector mounting, but remember this is an introductory level class. We have a full design class and then also a full installation class where we look at all of these specifics, all of the different types of equipment and all the ways that they can be, uh, that they are actually mounted. The purpose of this is to really provide us that overview. What are the main locations where I can possibly mount the collections? Do collectors, do I have a strong enough structure that is going to be able to handle this, um, or should I be looking to a ground mount? It's really just a survey of all those options that we have. So thank you again for your time, and we'll talk to you again soon.